Eviz's recent contributions to geovisualization and geospatial analysis. A Morse-Mill complex is a topological descriptor that captures the gradient flow of a scalar function. The best-known approaches for its computation incur large runtimes for bigger datasets. We address this gap by introducing the first completely GPU parallel pipeline, which achieves speedups of up to 7x, with our individual algorithms attaining speedups of up to 129x and 4.5x. This is a picture of a Tableau visualization within the browser. The data behind the visualization does not exist here, and Tableau is not running. This is just an image. However, parts of this image are fully interactive. Please join our presentation to see how we can share interactive visualizations across the web, free from any dependency on data or visualization application. Visualizing class separations is using applications such as classification and clustering. However, many dimension reduction techniques are limited due to the issues of separability and interpretability. We propose a visual analytics framework to support the exploration of nonlinear complex separation structures with the power of locally linear separations. DruidJS is a JavaScript library for dimensionality reduction where we implemented 11DR methods. A typical use case for DruidJS is a web tool using DR. You just need to import DruidJS, create a DR object, and then call the transfer method. That's it. See the talk, the paper, or the supplemental material for more information. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper.
Hi everyone, I'm Matt Kay. Uh, welcome to the second session of Believe Today, Evaluation Methods and Extensions. Um, thank you for everyone who participated this morning, uh, or if it was more in a different time of day for you. We had some great questions for both the presenters and for our keynote, uh, John Byrne Murdoch. So this session on Evaluation Methods and Extensions um, is going to have uh, 20 minute slots of 15 minute talks each with five minutes for questions. Uh, you can ask questions on Discord and YouTube. These will be curated and then I'll ask them to the presenters. Um, after that, please stick around. There's going to be a half hour of breakouts at the end. We're trying to recapture that kind of believe atmosphere in person where you have really nice in-person discussions and conversations as best we can. So what we're going to do is have a, a series of a couple of prompts, send you out into breakout rooms of four or five people and uh, let you discuss. So we're, we're trying to really get back some of that in-person believe experience uh, as best we can in the, in the virtual setting. Uh, to participate in the breakouts, you'll have to join on Zoom by finding the session in the Viz Virtual Conference website and clicking on the Join by Zoom link. Unfortunately, we can't give you the link on YouTube to prevent Zoom bombing, so please just go and do that. Uh, we'll leave you in the waiting room on Zoom until that breakout part, then we'll bring you in and assign people to breakouts. Um, in the meantime, watch on YouTube send questions on Discord. Michael Settlemeyer will be on there badgering you for questions. Um, please be generous to him. Um, so this session, Evaluation Methods and Extensions, one of the things um, that I love about Viz in general and believe in particular is our interdisciplinarity. Uh, this session, somewhat serendipitously, our, our, one of our original themes for Believe this year was going to be methods from other fields. And that kind of got waylaid like so many things by COVID. Um, but the three papers in this session still kind of embody that theme, which, which I'm very happy about. Um, the first paper, um, how to evaluate data visualizations across different levels of understanding is going to be presented by Alex Burns. Um, and this is a paper that's bringing in uh, Bloom's taxonomy from the education literature and trying to apply it to uh, visualization. So let's uh, let Alex take it away.
Hello, uh, my name is Alex Burns. Um, I am a graduate student at the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Today, I'm going to be presenting how to evaluate data visualizations across different levels of understanding. On behalf of my team, Cindy Schoen, Steve Frankenary, uh, Alberto Cairo, and Nargis Mayar. So take a look at this chart. What do you think the main message is? I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds. You can type that in the Discord chat or the YouTube chat and I'll uh, read some of those out loud. Cool. Yeah, so I'm noticing folks are saying there's uh, there's this really tall bar. We've got COVID is decreasing over these counties. Um, I'm not cheating if you know the answer. Um, cool. Okay. I'll do it again. What about this one? So take another 30 seconds, look at this chart, and tell me what you think the main message of this one is. Yeah, so we've got COVID counties are varying across the counties. The counties are doing different things. Got, yeah, there's some noisy data happening here. Some of them decreasing, but Fulton is not. All right. Cool. So what you may have noticed is that I actually played a little bit of a trick here, which is that both of these charts contain exactly the same information. The bars are just organized differently. So the one on the left, the one you saw first, um, the dates and the counties are sorted uh, by the highest daily cases. Um, you may actually recognize this chart. Um, this was a chart that was uh, created by a US state um, and it was eventually uh, taken down due to criticisms because it affords sort of this wrong conclusion that COVID cases are declining quite steadily. Um, on the right, we've reorganized the bars. So they are in chronological order this time and they're grouped by county. Um, and we can see that uh, this affords something totally different. We can see that it's going up and down. Um, all these counties are doing different things. So uh, we know that design influences perception, but we lack tools for comprehensively exploring and measuring how design influences user understanding. So uh, to address this gap, we have uh, looked to the field of education for inspiration and adapted one of the most common taxonomies of learning objectives um, in education called Bloom's taxonomy. Um, with it, we form a set of six questions that target different aspects of understanding. So our method works like this. You start with a visualization or a set of visualizations that you are interested in. You use your knowledge of what's in those charts with the six levels that are in the taxonomy. You use those as a guide to generate uh, six questions, one question per level. Once you got your questions, you can use them in user studies or experiments as you normally would. This uh, method proposed in the paper is different from existing methods because it is comprehensive. We'll see that it covers um, everything from low level, like basically chart reading, uh, tasks to making and justifying conclusions. Um, it's also uh, quite systematic. So you start with these charts, you follow the system, and then you end up with these six questions, um, which is a short set, but it gives you sort of a view of all different uh, kinds of ways that understanding can be affected. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to talk you through each of the six levels. I'm going to define each level for you. I'm going to talk about how we can adapt it for visualization, and I'm going to show you an example question using these. Uh, COVID charts that we've seen so far. So our first level is called knowledge. 
Um, the big idea here is that we'd like to recall basic facts or definitions. So in a classroom, this could be something like uh, defining a term or recalling a date of some important event. Here, we've adapted this to be low-level tasks like retrieving a point or identifying an access label, just something where the reader is identifying something directly in the chart and pulling them out. For example, we could ask a question like, which county had the largest numbers of cases in one day? Our second level is called comprehension. Here we are asking the uh, reader to demonstrate their knowledge in context. So it's no longer um, enough to just know the date that something occurred. You have to know a little bit more about that event. Um, this could be something like summarizing a passage of text. You're putting it in your own words. So here we can adapt this to tasks like summarizing the main message or explaining the topic of the chart, just like we did a minute ago. So we could ask a question like, how would you describe the data here to a friend without showing them the chart? Our third level is called application. There are kind of two different approaches that you could take to this. Um, the first is asking readers to apply the information to a new situation. This can be really hard um, because of the connection to domain knowledge. The other approach is to ask readers to represent their knowledge differently. So there are lots of different ways to do this. Um, but we could, for example, um, ask participants to calculate the difference between the number of cases on two different days. In that case, they are generating a number from the visual representation. So if you want to do that, we could ask a question like, how many fewer cases did Hall County have on May 1st than April 28th? Our fourth level is called analysis. Um, in this one, we are asking our a uh, reader to uh, separate the problem into parts and understand the relationship between those parts. Here we're translating relationship to mean something like spatial or data relationships. Um, so we could uh, at this level have things like describing the trend of a chart or uh, describing the relationship between two variables. So this is one stage where we might really expect to see a difference between these two uh, COVID charts, for example. If we asked a question like, how have the number of cases in Fulton County changed, uh, how have they changed over time? Um, we might really expect to see a difference uh, here. And I think someone in the chat actually pointed out that Fulton was doing something wrong. We'll come back to that. So our fifth level is called synthesis, which refers to tasks that ask the reader to use something that they know to create something new. So this is the first level where we are asking people to uh, do something kind of creative. Um, the tasks that you could do at this level differ depending on the input modalities that you have. Um, if you have some way to get an image or a chart from uh, participants, you could ask them to translate the data from uh, one form to another, such as giving them a table and asking for a chart, giving them a chart, ask for a table, something like that. If you only have text, you could do something like asking uh, the user to predict a future value. Here, they're taking their knowledge of the trends in the chart, the values that are in the chart, and they're uh, predicting into the future. So we could ask a question like, how many cases would you expect there to be in DeKalb County on May 10th? The chart in here, the text I know is really small, uh, goes up to May 9th. So we're just asking them to predict one day our sixth and final level is called evaluation. Here, the big idea is we want to uh, ask readers to judge the value of information and back that with evidence from the chart. So uh, we could ask our readers to come to a conclusion based on the data and justify it. In this, they're judging which data are best, uh, best support the conclusion. We could ask something like, if you were a lawmaker, what would you use these data to argue for and what evidence would you provide? In our paper, we uh, present three case studies with three pairs of real world visualizations. So in each pair, there's an original chart, that's the three on the top. Um, there's also a redesign that has the same information, um, which is that bottom row. The redesigns were either made by someone on our team or the original designer. The topics of these charts range from COVID-19 cases in the dark blue on the left. Um, there's uh, one about 
of the US trade deficit with China and manufacturing employment. Um, that is the light blues in the middle. And then there's the number of immigrants over time in Canada. Um, and that's our chart on the right. Um, we picked these charts, uh, we looked for original charts that were marked by the internet as being confusing. Um, and also uh, charts that um, had, that topics differed in relevance um, or sort of knowledge among our participants. So we uh, have seen that different visualizations afford, uh, might afford different conclusions. So the goal of our study was to, or our case studies, um, was to see if our method could capture these differences. Okay. So we found that not every pair of charts display differences at every level. For example, um, when we asked about the trend of uh, cases over time in Fulton County, those are our yellow bars, um, when participants uh, saw the chart on the left, um, they were more likely to describe the trend as going down, where participants saw the one on the right, um, they were more likely to describe it as up and down. Our study used a Latin square, so participants saw one or the other of these charts, but never both. However, um, when we asked uh, participants uh, what policy they would make and why, um, they came to virtually the same conclusions and gave the same evidence regardless of the chart that they saw. So by testing your visualization at a wide array of levels, um, you can find differences and similarities in areas that you might have expected, but also those that you didn't. So to conclude, uh, we adapted a common framework in education uh, called Bloom's Taxonomy, and we use it to evaluate data visualizations. Um, with it, we construct a set of six questions that assess six different aspects of understanding. The method improves on existing methods because it is systematic and comprehensive. You can get a really wide view of the different ways that understanding might be affected. So you might not find a difference at every level when you use this method, but you might be surprised at what you find. Thank you. Great, thanks for that uh, wonderful talk, Alex. Um, so we've had a couple of questions coming in on uh, Discord. Thanks everyone for uh, participating and doing that and for also participating in Alex's uh, interactive segment, uh, which is great. It's nice to try to get some of that in, into the virtual experience. Um, so the first question uh, uh, that I'm seeing is uh, from Natalia Andrienko. It says, the idea sounds quite reasonable, but is it really necessary uh, to do it for pairs of visualizations, one of which being obviously bad? Um, is it still valid to apply the framework to a single visualization? Yeah, sure, that's a great question. Yeah, you could definitely just apply this to a single one. Um, here we wanted to see, uh, in our case studies, we wanted to see what differences we could find between these two charts. Um, but yeah, you could definitely apply this for a single visualization if you wanted to see sort of what are things people thinking about or talking about, um, what conclusions are they coming to. So is, are there limitations to that? Like what, what led you to the paired method instead of going with a single method? Yeah, so for the paper, we wanted to see sort of, um, we wanted to demonstrate that there, that you could also use it to compare different different styles um, as well. Um, so while you could use it for one, there's nothing to compare it to. You can say like people think that there's gonna be two cases tomorrow, but you can't say that's different from if I encode it in a different way, which is mm -hmm. what we were hoping to show. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, these are fairly straightforward, familiar charts, bars and lines. Um, what about more complex charts, like maybe choropleths, um, or even highly complex charts like tree maps? Um, any work or thoughts about that kind of thing? 
Yeah, so it's possible that, yeah. So these, these charts were really pretty simple. Um, it's possible that um, participants would like, I imagine that there's a, a little bit, there might be a little bit more noise in there if you're um, showing, if you're using uh, kinds of charts that people are more unfamiliar with, you might get like kind of like unexpected results, but you might actually find something really neat with um, things where uh, like your average person might be um, thinking about these charts uh, in a way that you didn't expect. Um, so it might actually be really um, interesting there. Um, yeah, I think it would still work. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to see. Cool. Uh, so we have a, another question just coming in. Thinking out loud, probably a mistake, this person says, uh, it's Jason Dykes. Uh, if you are not a lawmaker, how reliable is your answer to the, if you were a lawmaker question? Um, this relates to the previous discussion of individuals coming to graphics, questions, et cetera, with different backgrounds, contexts, and expectations. Um, we probably need to assess reactions differently higher up the, the taxonomy as the information is less definitive. Yeah, I think that's that's true. There's always the, the um, conflicting problem of people have different opinions that they come in, um, which could be why one of the reasons that despite the fact that these charts sort of show different things, um, the two COVID charts show something but totally different. Um, they still, people still came to the same conclusion because they might have come in with the same conclusion. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. One of the things that is, is difficult about this upper levels is it's hard to establish like what is a good or reasonable conclusion. So you can sort mm -hmm. of like get what they're talking about and see if it's different, but it's really hard to establish like this is right or like a valid conclusion or just like the same, like they misunderstood something. Yeah, yeah, that's that's tough. Um, so I think we have maybe time for one more question. I'm seeing one there. Um, so for this type of evaluation, should we always use uh, every level of Bloom's taxonomy? If not, how do we choose the most relevant evaluative criteria for a chart in a situation? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we, using this particular method, would propose to look at all of them because you might find things that you expected, things that you didn't. Um, there is another paper that is being uh, presented at Biz this year uh, by uh, Eitan Adder and Elsie Lee, um, which is also using Bloom's taxonomy, but that targets uh, ask questions about specific levels. Um, so you might want to look at their paper for how if there's if you only want to look at some, um, they uh, they did some of that for, uh, for picking those and thinking about. Cool. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. And thanks, everyone, again, for all the questions online. Uh, so our next paper, um, continuing in this sort of serendipitous theme of methods from other fields, is using close reading as a method for evaluating visualizations, close reading being a method from literary studies. Um, this is going to be presented by Annie Barris. So we're going to switch over to that now. Hi, I'm Annie Barres, a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin in the Department of English Literature. Um, I'm presenting behalf of an interdisciplinary team comprised of computer scientists, visualization researchers, and domain scientists and artists. Our research focuses on how to bring artistic and design practice and theory to, to visualization to create more effective, engaging 3D multivariate visualizations. Our team has created tools and resources to allow artists to collaborate with scientists to better understand their data through visualizations. Last year, our team presented artifact-based rendering, which is a tool that allows artists to incorporate physical artifacts, things like sculptures, drawings, and natural objects into visualizations. We believe that in addition to making visualizations more effective, these by traditional method, by traditional measures like um, speed and accuracy, these multivariate 3D visualizations are more expressive and engaging. So this work really expands our visual vocabulary in the visualization community. 
Um, so during this research, we, we did begin to ask, though, how exactly do we evaluate visualizations for qualities that are typically referred to as subjective um, or more artistic, right? Things like expressive or engaging. To do this, um, we turn to close reading, um, we, we, and because we know that at their best, visualizations promote human connection. Um, we define human connection as a sustained internal conversation that incites viewers to curiosity, imagination, and a desire to act, explore, or learn more. Human connection depends upon the experience and associations that an individual viewer or user brings to their engagement with the visualization. So close reading is a foundational method of humanities research from literary studies. Um, and as a is and in this in our research, it became a tool that gives us insight into what degree specific visual, contextual, or associative features of a visualization work together to spark human connection um, in a viewer. So we turn to the humanities because if the arts give us a richer visual vocabulary for creating visualizations, then the humanities can give us a richer vocabulary. Um, to describe and evaluate why and how visualizations created using artistic and design expertise are more effective. For centuries, right, the humanities have developed methods for describing, analyzing, critiquing, and interpreting works of art and culture. Our work is inspired in part by research in the environmental and digital humanities that analyzes visualizations, including scientific visualizations, with the understanding that as environmental humanities scholar Heather Hauser's work reminds us, I'm quoting, data never stands alone, and that as the work of digital humanities scholars Amelia Acker and Tanya Clements signals, again, to quote them, data is, already, is always already a cultural product. So what is close reading? Um, in our previous research has defined close reading as close, careful attention to a text's content, what the text is saying, right? And its form, how um, its content is being said or expressed. Close reading relies on making observations about a text and analyzing how those observations of a text feature, of a text features, things like word choice, rhyme scheme, and structure contribute to its meaning. Um, while close reading was developed as a method to analyzing literary texts, um, like this poem by Elizabeth Bishop that I've annotated um, so you can see what um, the beginnings of a close reading look like and what we're looking for, today humanities researchers conduct close readings on a variety of cultural artifacts from poems to films to even things like advertisements. So in order to translate close reading to, as a method to visualization evaluation, we created a workflow that broke down the steps of close reading for study participants. We adapted this from the Close Reading Interpretive Toolkit, which was developed by um, researchers in English literature at the University of Texas at Austin. So it consists of six steps that walk participants through the process of close reading. Um, for our studies, we modified those, the, the, this workflow slightly to present them, um, to, pre to present it in a format that felt less like um, an assignment or a test and more like a guide or a series of prompts. So we asked participants to first summarize the visualization, second to create a list of observations about the visualization's features, third to determine which observations are most significant and why to their interpretation, um, in the fourth step, we asked participants what contextual information they needed to understand it better. Um, after that, we gave them a brief paragraph of contextual information. And after they read that, we asked what additional information do you still need that you don't have about the visualization. Then we asked them to kind of using all of their, the work they've done so far to explain their interpretation of the visualization. Um, then we ask them finally to reflect upon the interpretation of the visualization and an interpretation of the process itself. So this work, workflow can be presented to participants as a worksheet, like the one you see here, um, that they can fill out, or as a series of prompts for more kind of interview style evaluations. In a previous study we conducted, um, we gave participants hard copies of the worksheets and guided them through the process 
of close reading the visualization in a group setting. Um, however, in this follow-on study, um, we conducted individual interviews with scientists, visualization experts, and science communicators over Zoom. Um, and so in this case, to conduct the interviews, we presented the participants with a digital file of an image of the visualization via email, um, this image, uh, which is um, a visualization of biogeochemistry data in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the primary goal of the scientific visualization is to help scientists better understand their complex multivariate um, data. And it was this, this image was created using artifact-based rendering. Um, so on average, these interviews lasted for 31 minutes from beginning to end. Um, I facilitated these interviews, and to do so, I basically walked participants through the six steps of close reading. I sent them each of the steps, um, each of the prompts for each of the steps um, in the Zoom chat feature, and then read them to participants aloud. I told participants that they could answer the questions verbally or in writing. 11 of the 13 users chose to just speak um, extemporaneously and answered the prompts aloud. So in order to analyze the data that we had, we first transcribed all the interviews. I transcribed the interviews, which helped me to, which helped me to familiarize myself with the data. Um, and then we conducted uh, qualitative data analysis. Um, we didn't come to this to our um, data with any preconceptions. We just basically read over um, their answers several times and started grouping them into categories, um, into a few broad categories, which I've put up here, and then some more specific subcategories. And we wanted to see if we could draw any conclusions about the relationship between the participant profile category, like whether they were um, a scientist, a science communicator, or a visualization expert, and the groupings of their answers and the frequency that their um, answers showed up in certain in these groups. But um, our findings at this point were not statistically significant. However, we did collect some really interesting, helpful, um, formative evaluation data to, for future iterations of visualizations. Um, our results demonstrated that close reading effectively delivers useful and interesting information from careful close readings of the raw data and the coding process. Um, and we really found that close reading matched the exploratory goals of the visualization by prompting equally creative exploratory responses and interpretation um, by participants. So in what follows, I'm just going to present a couple of our most significant um, findings with some direct quotations from users to help illustrate this. So in terms of just being able to um, use this information to for future iterations of visualizations, we got some really helpful um, in information that came out in the form of critique um, through the interpretive process. So we had a couple more general um, comments, this is a mess, this looks like a work of art. But then we also got some really, you know, specific, um, specific commentary, critique um, about lighting, about distinct color contrast. And these moments kind of came throughout. Close reading really prompted um, users to critique, which is really helpful. Um, and then a more abstract, bigger picture finding, right, is that one of our clearest findings was the extent to which individual participant subject position influenced a user's interpretation of the visualization. So this study for us really points to the effectiveness of close reading as a method to explicitly study the effects of user subject position in interpreting visualizations. Um, nine of the 13 participants made explicit reference to their subject position when making interpretive claims. So subject position means basically where you are coming from um, when, you, when a user analyzes a visualization. These things could be everything from um, background to training to also kind of more sociocultural um, factors um, like your race, gender. Um, so as you can see here, um, users in several cases, right, nine of the 13 participants, made explicit um, references to their subject position, whether it was specific things like having a background as a graphic designer 
or more general things. Like, I don't know that much about biology, so I don't know what the glyphs look like. Um, and then one user did provide kind of a more, um, did provide a more kind of story-based narrative um, based on his subject position in reference to um, science and science communication. So we do not see the fact that close reading elicits information that arises from an individual's specific background as a weakness of this method. Um, instead, we consider it a strength that really allows us to study how user background influences a user's interpretation of visualizations. This factor, right, background is usually purposefully excluded from other evaluation methods, but we don't actually think that's realistic um, because we can never, right, truly separate our background and experience with a visualization um, from the ways that we interpret it in the real world. Um, we did, however, prevent to protect against confounding effects of different experiences with close reading as a method itself um, in the evaluation by excluding individuals um, from participating who have a lot of training in close reading, so are like literary scholars, for instance. So in terms of future work, a couple directions. One is kind of a comparative study between um, what information close reading elicits versus what information and how that's different from what information that more open-ended interviews um, elicit. Another direction is to actually evaluate 3D visualizations in video. We are just presenting users with images in this case, and also 3D visualizations in 3D environments. Um, so in conclusion, right, we found that because close reading activates users' interpretive responses to a visualization, it allows for more open-ended and perhaps unexpected evaluation results based on user experience with the visualization. Essentially, close reading is a method that allows us to get at the relational nature of visualizations. What we mean by that is that close reading helps us to understand and evaluate visualizations as not only sources of one-way information transfer, but instead a visual site that individuals come to with their own associations and preferences that really inform how they interpret and interact with the visualization. And finally, of course, we wish to thank our home institutions, the University of Texas at Austin and University of Minnesota, in addition to the National Science Foundation, Texas Advanced Computing Center, as well as the um, uh, Mark Peterson, Phil Wolfram, and other scientists at Los Alamos National Labs who, um, who research or who contributed to the E3SM model. Um, that's where the data for the visualizations that we used in this study and presented here came from. So thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation, Annie. And thanks again to everyone who's asking questions uh, on the Discord. Uh, the first question comes from uh, TJ Jenkin Kelly. It says, uh, since this is a viz and thus visual, did anyone try to draw parts of their responses? Or um, if not, how would that change the reading part of the protocol? Yeah, thanks. That's a really interesting question and something that I, I thought about. Um, so no one, we, we didn't have anyone try to draw um, their responses, um, especially, I mean, in the, in the Zoom, do it when we, you know, did it over Zoom, I feel like that was in some ways even, um, or I don't know, people did not, did not go there. But I think, um, you know, thinking about drawing, that, that is actually in like, you know, other visual ways of interpreting, um, a, that is, um, um, that, I think is something that literary scholars, I mean, I know I, in my own kind of like um, interpretive process, been, do spend some time kind of sketching out, um, you know, what, what I might think my um, interpretation of something might be, whether it's in like a chart or other kind of form. I'll also say too that annotation, right, which is something that other people um, in the visualization evaluation community have thought thought more about is kind of a, a way, a, a visual way of interpreting a text. You know, um, I had that slide there, but, you know, people use different colors. Um, all You know, most people have their own kind of literary scholars and other people obviously have their own kind of systems and taxonomies for like, I put a star when, when the thesis, when I come across the thesis, mm -hmm. I highlight certain things in green. Um, so yeah, I think there are definitely 
visual forms of interpretation. Um, and I could see how, especially in the annotation process, um, that could be um, really helpful and kind of gu maybe guiding people to that more um, as part of this close reading process is a helpful um, thought. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, another question from Petra Eisenberg. Um, if people are asked to do close reading, does that prohibit them from certain types of experiences due to the nature of the task, e.g. experiences of fun or pleasure? Um, I think close reading is really fun. Um, I, that is to me um, the most pleasurable um, scholarly activity that I do. Um, I know that it might feel different for different people. Um, but yeah, I don't think that close reading and fun are mutually exclusive, but I do think um, that the way that we have maybe presented, um, you know, our this particular form of close reading as an evaluation method mm -hmm. could be um, made more kind of, or just encourage people more to creativity rather than like strictly, you know, rather than these um, steps, which originally we adapted them from um, as I said, like a pedago pedagogical um, tool. And originally it felt even more kind of like, like in our pilot study, participants felt like they were like taking a test and they were like worried about getting something wrong, which we, there is, a, I think some people still did feel a bit like that. So yeah, come, I think just continually continuing to kind of hone the prompts in a way that encourages kind of more fun and creativity um, throughout the process is, is another, um, you know, helpful way forward, I think for us. So, so thanks for that, that question. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, and I should say, there's a pile of questions uh, coming through, which is great. Um, uh, any, any, if you can, you know, go on and reply afterwards on Discord or folks can reach out to her, that would be awesome. I think we have time for maybe one more if I'm squeezing a little bit. Um, and uh, I, th I think, so there's a question from Jumana Al-Mamoud, which says, uh, could this method work uh, with the Think Aloud protocol or is close reading not observable while users are reading? No, I think it could definitely work with a think aloud protocol. Um, and, you know, I could see while we had participants work through this in a, a worksheet kind of way, um, I could, you know, when I teach close reading, um, this is only one method that I use among many to teach it, one of which is just what, what it seems more like, you know, group discussion brainstorming, right, where we, um, you know, kind of go through these steps um, maybe not in this like totally, you know, as structured a manner, but it definitely feels more like people kind of collectively like throwing out ideas um, and brainstorming, think, thinking aloud than, and I think we could observe that right by, you know, recording that or taking notes on that, that process and how people build on each other, um, on each other's mm -hmm. responses, I think would be really interesting too. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for the questions and uh, Annie for the excellent talk. Um, our next talk is going to be, um, again, continuing this serendipitous theme of uh, methods from other fields. Uh, we have micro entries, encouraging deeper evaluation of mental models over time for interactive data systems. Uh, and that's going to be presented by Jeremy Block. Um, and this is a method inspired by methods in microgenetic research. So another interesting field to draw upon um, as we sort of expand our set of uh, visualization evaluation methods. Uh, take it away, Jeremy. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy Block and I would like to introduce you to an evaluation methodology that I've been developing with my colleague, Dr. Eric Reagan. Uh, and in the next few minutes, I'd like to introduce you to this technique that we refer to as micro-entries. 
it's safe to say that artificial intelligence systems are everywhere, with some exciting and questionable applications from self-driving vehicles and automated judging to stock market assistance and surveillance tasks. The AI powering these tools use lots of data to make decisions, but their methods are not always obvious to human users. So when they perform incorrectly, it can be near impossible to debug because the unique patterns they use to make decisions are the same qualities that human users struggle to find on their own. Therefore, the area of explainable artificial intelligence is developing visualizations to try and communicate how these tools make suggestions and decisions. There have been many different approaches proposed, but one recent example I'll be referencing throughout this talk was developed last year by Fred Homan and his colleagues from Georgia Tech. They call their tool Summit, and it, takes, uh, it tries to visualize, communi uh, visually communicate how a neural network classifies images in different categories, like bathtub, lion, or chocolate sauce. As is commonplace in XAI applications, the interface is complex, and as a user works with it, they likely change how they think about it too. This interface is split into three key areas to help explain why an image may be classified. In this example, we are looking at the white wolf class. So in the left corner, uh, all 1,000 classes are dimensionally reduced into a 2D mapping at uh, each layer of the Inception V1 model. And below that is a list of all the possible classes and the associated system's accuracy. Uh, and we can explore each of the neuron activations for, a for this selected white wolf class in the main tree view. Here, the visualization tries to examine uh, and explain how the system makes decisions by showing the most highly activated nodes linked through their most relevant influences. This size, uh, the size intuitively encodes the relevance of particular paths and nodes, and this emphasizes that uh, there are, there are most, the most activated pieces uh, for, for a specific image. The nodes are generate, uh, generated by the system, so to make them interpretable, each neuron shows the characteristic image fragments as a proxy for a more semantic label or title. For example, this node, 428, looks like it responds to image segments of a four-legged creature. Uh, I'm not sure how to give that a label, so we'll provide this thumbnail set uh, as, a, as an explanation from the data. Yet, as is often the case with visualization research, we want to do more than just make pretty pictures. Ideally, we want to evaluate the effectiveness of the tool. There are many questions to ask when evalu evaluating a tool like, uh, who might this tool be for? Is it too complicated for lay users to understand? How intuitive are the visual data encodings? What does someone think about when they're looking at the data and its features? Do their thoughts follow any general patterns? When do users start feeling comfortable with the system? And what order do they discover those insights? Also, how critically are users reviewing your visualization? Essentially, given this visualization, we, would, we want to understand the user's mental model of the system and how this understanding might shift over time. Uh, there are so there are uh, all of these questions. They try to assess the mental model, uh, and there's been lots of different uh, techniques that, that elicit these, these, uh, these questions. As Kenneth Craik initially described, a mental model is a representation uh, users have of the world and how it works. Since he described them in 1943, there have been many different methods that try to help extract these fuzzy, emotional, and temperamental pictures of the world from people's minds. A variety of the techniques used in practice, uh, but for the sake of brevity, uh, two fairly popular evaluation techniques are the think aloud and prediction tasks. Think aloud method uh, asks users to provide uninterrupted commentary of what they're seeing as analogous to their stream of consciousness. This method is fairly easy to implement because the user interacts with the interface and describes their thoughts out loud. It can also provide some insights into the relative importance of interface elements based on the user's sequence of attention. The things uh, mentioned earlier on may be superficially highlighted by the design and sequential comments may build on each one uh, to show how the user arrives at their final mental model. Yet this technique is limited by the communication potential of the user, and it doesn't guarantee that the users are critically reflecting on the patterns they're seeing. This may lead to the illusion of explanatory depth, where users think they understand something until they're asked to explain how it works. For example, Think about turning a steering wheel. Do you know all of the simple machines that transfer your turning to the wheels? On the other hand, the prediction task asks the user to predict how they expect the system to respond given some novel input. If the user has a clear picture of how the system works, they can identify what triggers faulty behavior. 
Thus, taking the perspective of the system and correctly selecting how the system should respond. The technique encourages reflection of the behaviors and the user has previously observed uh, and can serve as a proxy for their understanding. The task is generally implemented as a series of multiple choice questions, so it's especially useful for capturing many users' perspectives at scale. Yet in order to gain any value from this technique, the specific questions used uh, need to be carefully constructed, uh, constructed so the researcher can control what features users uh, should recognize. The technique is also prone to users misunderstanding the premise. After continually working with a system, some users may not recognize that the questions are asking the user to take the perspective of the system, and there's no way to separate the user's misunderstanding of the directions from those that didn't recognize the systemic patterns. Finally, there, it, since it takes time to get familiar with the interface and how the system performs, this technique is generally implemented as a post-task task assessment. That makes uh, the, the, this means that visual uh, temporal relationships, like the order of aha moments or the relative influence of those discoveries on the user's perspective, that's all lost. So since mental models change frequently and are subject to the illusion of explanatory depth when we don't have critical reflection, we need a tool that can track these states and encourage reflection in situ. In our paper, we suggest a technique that invites users to mark and explain why they think they see a pattern in the interface. This will encourage reflection, helping users clearly recognize concrete patterns in the data as an, and <laughs> as an added bonus by capturing when each statement is made. A hierarchy of ideas can be associated with a timeline of interactions. So with frequent time-specific prompts, the micro entries technique encourages user reflection and lets researchers capture those changes to mental models over time. Let me try to contextualize this concept by looking at the earlier example. In the Summit interface, we want to know what users can deduce from our visualization aid. If we only ask users to use the think aloud approach, they may note some elements of interest, perhaps the animation between the nodes, but they may not connect what they are seeing to a broader picture or systemic issue. On the other hand, if we assume we can design a handful of special class prediction questions where the user associates a tree with its correct class, for example, we can miss their valuable intermediate mental models because we're only assessing once at the end. So to implement micro entries, we suggest something off to the side of the interface and ask users two key things, describe a pattern and explain to themselves why they think that pattern exists. By explaining why the pattern exists, users have to provide a rationale and inherently process more about what they're seeing. So for example, let me assume the perspective of the user uh, and we're going to take a look at this as an example. So the animated edges of the graph show movement and this draws my eye towards it. So my first micro entry may be in reference to this, something like data flows from the bottom to the top. Uh, and the reason might be the animations of the edges imply data moving up. So from this initial record, we have an idea of what the user, or I, found most prominent. In addition to this pattern, we capture when it was discovered, and I'm providing a rationale about what makes it an interesting finding to me. So later on, I may recognize that classes share similar nodes and realize that my initial idea was incorrect. For example, node 762 uses the same examples from the data and is activated by both the red wolf and the red wolf and the white wolf classes. And using our visual breadcrumb on screen, I can update my uh, initial entry with something like data flows throughout the network and explain it with, it doesn't make sense that an input image would visit each of these nodes, but rather that each node is a filter to apply over an input image. And just like that, we've captured this change in my thinking and we have a better understanding of how the mental model is developing for the user. Looking at the previous entry side by side, we see that I'm drawn toward this moving component with an incorrect premise, and it takes time to reorient that thinking. Even if this was something covered in the introduction and tutorial of the system, evaluating what users uh, initialize from this may not always be easy. Given enough time and enough participants, we can start looking for patterns in users' approaches to the different specific uh, interfaces. Uh, do users consistently see the same patterns or go down the wrong path? Uh, do they consistently perform the same combination of actions? In our paper, we suggest a handful of approaches, some of which leverage visualization techniques that help to generalize and generate these, uh, these kinds of insights from the data. So in summary, the micro entries technique is intentionally asking users to explain to themselves how the patterns they notice exist to encourage them to, ref uh, more, to encourage more critical thought about the system functionality, thus making their mental models more interpretable. By designing our collection instrument to allow uh, users to frequently reflect in an unobtrusive way, 
we expect users to clarify their mental models and make it easier to communicate them as well. The added benefit of having users control how ideas are interrelated and updated provides an added dimension for researchers to draw insights. Users can signify and update uh, to an old pattern by readdressing an, an old entry, and we track any of those changes to find patterns across users and time. Of course, there's also some concerns that warrant further explanation. Firstly, there's a concern that users may not mark anything as a pattern because they're not sure how small a detail constitutes a pattern. Perhaps this behavior could be balanced by intentionally prompting users for their thoughts as a set of intervals uh, or at specific interactions, like after they finish a certain task. Uh, this would ensure that we have a consistent flow of user feedback. But asking users to make entries is not only disruptive, it also increases the demand for feedback. When the demand for feedback is high, participants are likely to notice patterns that may not exist just to feel like they're appeasing the researchers. So finding the right balance to this prompting pattern may be challenging and different in all cases. There's also a concern that the identified patterns are not recognizable or not rec um, are only recognizable because of thorough contemplation or the ability to offload working memory. Critically thinking about one's interactions will clearly lead to different thoughts than just working off of one's first impressions. With the microentry approach, distilling this difference may be impossible. So because we provide a space for users to basically drop their thoughts, we support the ability to consider the thought more tangibly. But this discounts the ecological validity for when the interface is released without the microentries technique attached. So we'll lose this ability to know what users find naturally without the intervention. So all in all, what we present in this paper is an initial concept that acts not as a replacement for uh, the other mental model measurement techniques, but rather as an amendment to the available arsenal. The microentries approach is designed to evaluate how users understand complex visualization tools by capturing the shifts in their mental model and helping them recontextualize recognized patterns. Because explainable artificial intelligence usually incorporates complex visualizations in order to communicate how it works, this technique tracks what users describe and interact with in order to bring clarity to their own mental model and communicate to the researcher how that clarity develops over time. We're using visualizations to try and give people a more clear mental model, but many common ways we measure those mental models are not adapted to both capture how mental models shift while also encouraging the user to reflect on notice patterns. If you have more questions or you're interested in more details, we invite you to take a look at our paper. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thanks for that awesome talk, Jeremy. And thank you, everyone, for all the questions that are coming in. Um, our first question is from TJ. Uh, it says, this granular annotating seems to fit well with a provenance model that captures what the user did to interact. Have you tried to analyze both to see if they uh, tell, have you tried to analyze both uh, to see if they tell you anything? Um, or do you have any thoughts on how you would? So. That is a really excellent question. Um, this this does definitely inspire some thinking about provenance in general. Um, we have not uh, officially implemented this technique to see how it works. So uh, I do think that there would be space to do some kind of comparison uh, study to look at how or how different the two techniques might work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So next question is from uh, Arvind. It says, this is a really interesting methodology. I'm curious about whether there are any concerns or confounds about applying it um, in the explainable AI context. Um, in particular, how much of the interpretation of machine learning behavior is happening because of the XAI interface versus the micro entries prompt? So I think that addresses one of the limitations of like offloading your working memory into into this in this uh, interface. Um, so in a way, the 
there are lots of different things. We, we chose Summit just to give us some, some structure to, to explain with. Um, but the, 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 the way that you think about something and, and what's communicated by the interface, those, that's more or less what this is really aimed to try to address. We're trying to encourage users to think more about what they're seeing, what patterns are they finding. And XAI is an excellent example of it's a complex interface. There's lots of different ways for it to uh, be displayed. And there's lots of different ways it can be interpreted. And as researchers, we want to know what, what, are think, what are people thinking about? How are they getting to different conclusions? And I think that micro entries is the way that we can, or at least a, a particular uh, mental model measurement technique that we could potentially try. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so Sean McKenna asks, um, what if your inputted micro entry is wrong or missing some information? Uh, like, do you create a new micro entry or is there a way to edit it? Um, does that change the timestamp? Um, and what if you wanted to link different micro uh, entries together over time? Another great point. Um, so the, the, the interface we propose is a pro proposition. <laughs> so uh, there are definitely ways that we could reconsider how those interactions might happen. I think that there's a lot of value in having something that would uh, collapse different nodes as you as you build in different entries. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it would be you would add a new entry, you'd update whatever you're thinking. Um, hopefully, people are paying attention enough to what they're uh, what they're seeing that they will uh, they'll add in uh, the appropriate context or they'll overwrite what they've already done uh, to to address one of their thing whatever they've been thinking about. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely something that is open to interpretation and not necessarily set in stone. We just wanted to give some structure for people to latch onto as we were trying to describe the technique. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so again, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, I'll encourage you to go uh, back to the Discord and for folks to reach out to Jeremy as well. Um, I'm just going to end up with uh, one last question. Um, we'll uh, do one here from Petra Eisenberg. Um, in your experience, to what extent uh, do people report on visualization design features versus data patterns, like discoveries that they make uh, in the data? Um, can you make them report on just one or the other, or do they do they tend to make that decision for themselves? <laughs> yeah, it's a really great point. Um, so the the way that we structured this was saying that you know if we ask people to look for patterns in particular hopefully that will help guide them towards actual patterns in the data and not just visual inter like interaction pieces um so it's a, it's a tough question i don't know that there's a there's an easy way to do it like i said this is a design that we're proposing and we'd like to have comments and feedback and and discussion about it um so uh maybe it's it's possible that there are ways to encourage people to do that. I have not necessarily tried this with enough uh, with enough validity to say one way or the other, but I could see that uh, hopefully by giving them uh, context about asking only about patterns, we might be able to get some some pattern specific questions. Yeah, I, I feel it's often hard to guide people if you give them an open text box. <laughs> There's only so much they take from your uh, exactly. prompt, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, great. Okay, so th let's let's thank Jeremy again, um, and uh, thank thank you again to everyone who's online asking questions. Um, we're going to uh, move on to the breakout session in a moment, and I'll have instructions for that in a second.
Great. So uh, now we're just moving on to the last section of uh, this session, um, which is the Zoom breakout room. So if you're still just watching on YouTube, please go to that uh, virtual Viz session link. Um, find this session, find the link uh, for the Zoom and come on and join. We're going to start letting people in from the waiting room and then we will be uh, randomly assigning you to breakout rooms with four or five people. Um, I'm gonna wait a minute for folks to start coming on and for the waiting room to be admitted. And then I'm going to give you a prompt and let you discuss for uh, about 10 minutes. We're gonna do that three times. Um, and then after that, that will be the end of this session. Again, this is our attempt to try to get that in-person uh, discussion and a little bit of serendipity that you would get from a conference um, more so than just, uh, you know, from the virtual presentation uh, portion. Um.